Father, we thank you that you are the God of all truth. We thank you that you love us. And we thank you that your word gives us instructions for our heart. And today we want to have a journey in our heart into greater freedom because of what you are teaching us. So open our hearts and our eyes and our ears to hear and to receive so that we can be the people you want us to be and receive your love and grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in a spiritual war and our enemy is a nasty enemy and one of his tricks is to deceive us or to mislead us. And as he does that, we can often be completely fooled as to what's going on. So, for instance, people might say, I want to come and get some help. And the enemy says, ah, I'm going to stop them getting help. So he'll bring up problems or he'll have them have an argument with somebody or he'll fill their heart with doubts. And that will stop them getting the help that they were going to go and get. An example. In New Zealand, I was assisting a family. And the wife of the family said that her husband had many problems and needed to get some help. But every time she suggested to him that he should come and see me and get some assistance, he would say, why? There's no problems. And she would think there are so many problems but he's, it's like he was blind, he could not see them. And so one day they were sitting at the dinner table and he was talking about some issue and she said, you know, you should talk to Pastor Chris about that. Why don't you get on the phone right now before you forget and ring and make an appointment to see Pastor Chris? And he said, oh, okay, I'll do that. And he stood up and he walked across to where they had a phone hanging on the wall. He picked up the phone and was about to dial, and then he put it back down again and then sat back down. And the wife said, weren't you going to phone Pastor Chris? He said, well, I was going to, but then I thought, there's no real problem. I don't really need his help. So the enemy was actually working in his mind even right then when he was ready to ask for help. The wife was very annoyed with our enemy, and she excused herself from the table, and she went to her bedroom, and she prayed to Devil, you're a dirty rat. You are, you are keeping my husband from freedom, and I'm not very happy with that. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I won't let you mess up my family and block my future because you're deceiving my husband. She prayed a very annoyed prayer against the devil. She then came back out and sat at the dinner table to pretend that nothing had happened. And her husband said, 3 o'clock Thursday. And she said, what's three o'clock Thursday? She said, oh, that's the time I'm going to talk to Pastor Chris. When you were out of the room, I suddenly thought, yes, I do have problems. And yes, I should talk to Pastor Chris. So I've made the phone call and I've made the booking. So there was the enemy very much at work, even when this conversation was happening at their dining room table. So as we come to be able to learn God's wisdom and prepare our hearts, recognize that the enemy is going to come in. He wants to distract you. He wants to get you going off on some tangent. He wants to fill your mind with worry about whether something on the stove is still cooking or not. He will do things like that to get you to stop paying attention to the Word of God and stop responding in your heart. So before we go any further, I want to pray that the enemy's hand will be broken. We want to still our hearts focus our hearts, humble our hearts, and open our hearts. We want to bind the enemy. We want to put out our humanness, our flesh aside. If you're feeling hungry or if you're feeling distracted in some way, we want to submit to God and receive God's word. So let me just pray a prayer with you about that. In the name and the powerful, lovely name of Jesus, I bind and break the power of the enemy's work in each of our lives and in those listening to this message. I break the power of the enemy and I will not let the enemy distract them or confuse them or muddle their minds or take them away from the goodness that God has. I release the anointing of the Spirit of God upon each of us that we would receive God's word and receive God's love and be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, I want you to realize, too, that we, whether we realize it or not or want to admit it or not, are very often living in some form of slavery. The Bible says we become uh, bound by sin, we have pride, we have shame, we have hurts, we have guilt, we have fear, we have addictions, there are evil spirits, there's deceptions and lies, there's empty hopes, foolishness, anger, jealousy, bitterness. All this stuff comes into our lives and it enslaves us. And then we begin to feel like, oh, well, I'm just different now to the way I used to be. Uh, or I, I wish I had more patience, but I just don't. I guess it's my personality. I guess it's the way God made me. But in fact, it could well be that the enemy has brought his work into your life in order to enslave you. And Jesus is the one who sets us free. People can live their whole lives in various forms of slavery and not even know it. Have you ever met people that are angry and they go off like a hair trigger at anything? And they say, it was just the way I am. Well, it's not the way God made them. It's the way the enemy has messed them up. And we have this wonderful scripture out of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus came to destroy the devil and to free those who for the whole of their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So there are people who for the whole of their life are trapped and they don't know it. They think, well, it's just the way I am. It's just everyone from where I come from is like this or all my family is like this. It's just the way we are, but it's actually slavery. So I want you to pray a prayer of openness. And the prayer that I've got up here says, Lord, I don't want to be a slave. Help me see the areas that you want me to deal with and give me faith to respond to you. Don't let me go through life blind and fooled and missing your best for me. Why don't we pray that together? Lord, I don't want to be a slave. Help me see the areas that you want me to deal with and give me faith to respond to you. Don't let me go through life blind and fooled and missing your best for me. The other thing that's important to know then is that it's Jesus who sets us free. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, if the Son, that's Jesus, sets you free, you are truly free. You, you're absolutely free on the inside, in your heart, in your mind, in your habits and everything. And then in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 it says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not get entangled again in the yoke of slavery. So we are able to become free. We're able to be free. And it's wonderful over the years to have seen different people get blessed as they've been prayed for by others or I prayed with them. And areas where they've been bound and thought they could never be free, they actually come free and they're almost laughing. This is wonderful. I've never, never thought I would feel this free. Well, that's what Jesus has done. He's come to be able to set us free. So I want you to pray for freedom. I pray like this, Lord, thank you for freedom through Jesus. Show me how to get that freedom and to stay free as I serve and worship you. Let's pray that together. Lord, thank you for freedom through Jesus. Show me how to get that freedom and stay free as I serve and worship you. We're going to ask the Lord to be the one who brings us freedom. Now, we may not see what binds us. We might think our own way is normal, uh, when it's far below what God actually has for us. We can hold on to ideas and life patterns and responses and fears and false hopes, etc., which stop us receiving our full freedom. And I don't want you living in any kind of slavery. I want you to live with the freedom that God has for you. People come to me and say, well... I've got fears and I've just had them all my life and I've done everything I can to deal with them. I guess I'm just going to have to live with these fears. Say, so, no, you don't have to live in slavery. You can be set free. And so another prayer to open our eyes. Lord, open my eyes and my heart to know the truth that sets me free. Show me things I cannot see and give me wisdom so I'll make the right choices. What if we pray that together? Lord, open my eyes and my heart to know the truth that sets me free. Show me things I cannot see and give me wisdom so I will make the right choices. I recall a testimony from a, a rather amazing man of God working in Mexico, David Hogan, and 
he was in a battle uh, fighting for the health of his daughter who had gone through a whole bunch of terrible uh, medical emergencies and went from one to the next to the next to the next and he was struggling with God over this thing and suddenly he realized it's like his eyes were opened and he thought, this is the devil. This is just the devil attacking me and my family and I've got no fear of standing up against the devil. He was more intimidated by a doctor with some big medical name, but he wasn't afraid of the devil. When he realized his eyes were open, this is the devil. He said, devil, get your hands off my daughter. Get your hands out of her life. I break your power. And suddenly she recovered. So it wasn't that there was, there was not a truly a medical emergency. It was the devil creating the impression of that over and over again. So I want your eyes to be open to whatever is happening in your life. Now, because God loves you, he wants to lead you into full freedom. So he shows you where you need healing and release. But our pride and selfishness can stop us responding to God. I can remember in my late teenage years that I would sense God speaking to me and saying to me that there was something I had to deal with and I'd feel like, don't pick on me. I'm a good boy. I'm not like those other people down there. Go and pick on them. They're the people that are doing the bad things. But God loved me and he wanted me to be free. I had feelings of inferiority and shame. I had other things in my life that bound me up. And when God came to talk to me about them, I really didn't want to talk to him about it. One, because I felt pain. Two, because I felt ashamed. And three, I really didn't know that I could trust God to get in there and deal on the inside of me. So even though God loved me, I was pushing him away. And today, as we come through these steps, you'll discover more about how God wants to set you free. But I need you to have an open heart. And so this is our prayer of thanks. Lord, thank you for loving me. I don't deserve your care and attention, but I really appreciate it. Pour your love into my heart so I become captivated by you and want only to please you in my life. Let's pray that together. Lord, thank you for loving me. I don't deserve your care and attention, but I really appreciate it. Pour your love into my heart so I become captivated by you and want only to please you in my life. Praise God. Because God wants to set you free, he loves you, he wants to set you free, in order to do that, he's got to put his spotlight onto something in your heart or your mind or your life that he knows needs to be dealt with. And as I said a moment ago, when God did that for me, I rejected it. I pushed away the things that God was trying to show me. I didn't really want to have to deal with it. Now, God can use a number of means to prompt our heart and to open our eyes. We might be reading God's word or hearing a sermon or a message or even a Christian song and something will speak to us and we'll realize, oh, that's something that's not quite right in my life. Sometimes there's circumstances or there's conviction by the Spirit or pressures that come upon us or problems or difficult people. God can use all of those and many other means to point out to us that we have a problem. When I was a little boy in primary school, I loved the idea of being up front. I thought that was wonderful, and I loved the idea. And the only way to be up front, apart from in your class, was at the school assembly. At the school assembly, a boy and a girl, usually from the grade five or grade six, would march up onto the platform and stand beside the flagpole where the Australian flag was flying, and they would recite the school pledge and lead in a school prayer. These were the two things that were done. It only took a minute or two. But I wanted that job because I wanted to be up front in front of all the kids. So one day the the teacher asked if I would like to do that. And I said, yes, yes, please. I did. So the next morning I was dressed neatly and standing on the side of the platform. And when the principal gave his little nod or whatever, the girl and I got up and we walked in step and we came all the way across and stood right beside the flagpole and looked out at all the kids and they were looking straight at me. And my face went red like a beetroot. Like just, I could feel it burning with shock of, of embarrassment. My eyes began to blink at 90 miles per hour and tears came streaming down my face. I was just completely stunned. I did not expect that to happen. As I stood there, 
face glowing red, blinking 90 miles per hour, tears running down my face. I, I knew the pledge, so I could lead all the kids in the pledge, and then we had to wheel around and, and walk our way off the platform. And once we got off the platform, my eyes stopped. I stopped blinking and my face settled. I thought, what in the world is that? I didn't know I had that sort of problem in me until the situation came up. Now, I didn't know anything about God's love and God wanting to set me free. I just knew I had a problem. And I chose that I would work out how to conquer my problem. And I conquered my problem by bravado, by appearing confident. I thought, I'll, I'll push through this thing. I'll just be, I'll be confident. There were other issues that one day I'll tell you the long version of the story. But I, I would find if I walked into a room, I was afraid that I would see people looking at me because that would be embarrassing. So I would look at people's feet. I'd look at the ceiling, but not at the people. And so I had all sorts of things that were messing me up. It was a deep-seated insecurity based on rejection, I guess, in my life. Now, God was shining the light on that, and he shone the light on many other things in my life from time to time. Suddenly, a memory comes back, or a reaction to something happens, and God will say, Chris, I'm showing you that's something you've got to deal with. I continued to pretend that I was confident for probably the next six or seven years. I thought I had conquered my problem. And I got up and I spoke. I, I acted on the stage. I, I won speaking competitions. I was the ace debater in the school. It was wonderful. I loved being up front. And I, I was using my, my pretend confidence to be able to do that. And then one Sunday morning, in a little tiny church with only 30 people in it, in a hired hall, my pastor asked me to get up and lead some songs. And so I led a couple of happy songs. And then usually we would finish with a song that people would sing, usually with their eyes closed, because it was like a prayer song or a worship song. We got to that song, and all of a sudden, my eyes began to blink at 90 miles per hour. Tears began to stream down my face, and my face was red like a beetroot. And, and thankfully, most of the people had their eyes closed, and they weren't looking at me. I got off the platform as quick as I could and went and sat on the front row with my back to all of the people so they couldn't see, and I recovered. I said, God, I've got a problem. And I did not hear God's voice, but it was like God said, Chris, I've been trying to tell you that for a long time, but you weren't listening. You didn't want to know. You were pretending that everything was fine. So I think we need to pray a prayer that goes like this. Lord, Many issues in my life may be you showing me where I need you. Forgive me for not realizing that. Give me understanding about what is happening in my life and wisdom about how to respond the way you want me to. Let's pray that good prayer. Lord, many issues in my life may be you showing me where I need you. Forgive me for not realizing that. Give me understanding about what is happening in my life and wisdom about how to respond the way you want me to. I found that the way that God has done most of his work in my life has been when I would talk to him and let him move in my life. It's really very, very much a relationship. Yes, I heard things from preachers. Yes, I was touched by things that people sang in songs. Yes, I was touched by things in the word of God. But my spiritual life has really been about the times I talked to God. And so I'm giving you these prayers for you to talk to God. Because you and God have an amazing relationship. And once you get that flowing really well, God is going to pour into your life wonderful things. But if you sit back thinking, well, I'll just get the pastor to pray for me, or I'll get the prayer team to pray for me, and you don't have that journey yourself, you're going to miss out on so much of what God has for you. If God has been trying to speak to you, to get your attention, to get you to change things in your life, you may not have realized it. But I'm going to ask you this question. Are there things God has already been talking to you about and you've not realized it? Or like me, you've been trying not to hear what God is saying? I want you to take a moment and to bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm going to pray this prayer. Father, in Jesus' name. Show these people what it is that you've been talking to them about and they didn't realize it. Show them the areas where maybe they have refused to listen. 
maybe out of fear or maybe out of some other distraction. Lord, grab a hold of these people in Jesus' name and open their hearts to what you're saying in and through them. And friends, I want you to stop and just pause for a moment and say, God, is there something you're talking to me about? And to just make note of it, God, I, I realize you have probably been talking to me about my pride or my impatience or my selfishness or that I won't forgive that person. There could be a thousand things God is talking to you about. Open your heart and make note of what it is that God is wanting to deal with in your life. God is in the business of rebuilding and restoring damaged, damaged lives. I told the testimony last week about a, a friend of my daughter, Sophia, who had had some incident happen 10 years ago that had brought pain and difficulty into her life. And she had gone to her pastor, she'd gone to a, a praying Christians, she had gone read books, looked for ways to solve this problem, and nothing had helped her. She had at one point gone to some people who had a prayer ministry, they prayed for her, and she was somewhat benefited, but the problem persisted. And she finally decided that there was no cure for her pain and her problem, and she was seeing a psychologist to try and find some way to cope with and live with the issues in her life. My daughter Sophia and her friend prayed with this other contact down in Tasmania, and they led her through the things I'm talking to you about today. And over a couple of days of going through these things, this girl became completely free from something she thought she would never be free from. And here's the scripture about that, Isaiah 58. Your people will build up old waste places. You will raise up the foundations of many generations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And we know in the scripture, even in, in that fam famous Psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He says, he restores my soul. So there's a restoration work that God does. Psalm 147 verse 3 says, he heals the broken in heart. The broken hearted. He heals the broken in heart and binds up all of their wounds. So God is in the restoration business. And the Holy Spirit is very active in that process. We have Isaiah 61, which was uh, quoted by Jesus when he was in his opening up his ministry, and it goes like this. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord anointed me to preach good news to the meek. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty or freedom to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. This is the anointing of the Spirit of God doing that work. And it goes on and says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so they might be called trees of righteousness, God's planting, that he might be glorified. And they will build the old wastes, raise up the former desolations and repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Can you see a really strong restorative message there? Have you been damaged, bruised, insulted, wounded, hurt? Uh, are you in some way crippled in your thinking or your emotions or your personality? God is in the business of restoring all of those things. And look at these other verses about God wanting to bless you. He restores my soul. We saw that from Psalm 23. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We saw that in Psalm 147. Jesus said, my peace I give you. Let not your heart be troubled or afraid. And then call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. God wants to bless you. He wants to, to do things in your life that you may not think he's even able to do. Now, one of the problems I had when I felt that God was talking to me and wanting to deal with things in my life, I was afraid of God. I like a child with, with a wound and a bandage over the wound, and someone says, oh, let me have a look at it. You think, no. For you to have a look at it, we've got to tear the bandage off, and that's going to hurt. And then you're going to want to poke it and say, does it hurt? There? I don't want you touching my wound. No, no. And that's how it felt when God came to me and said, Chris, 
I want to deal with you. I want to help you. Uh, I want to deal with your hurt. I'm thinking, no, you've got fat fingers. I can't trust you to touch my pain without hurting me. And yet this scripture that I'm going to show you now was so wonderful in helping me out of Isaiah 42. A bruised reed he will not break, and the smoking ember he will not put out. He will bring forth truth, judgment. You see, I remember as a child, um, mum had a bit of a garden, not much of a garden, and we were told not to kick our ball anywhere near the garden. But, you know, you do things, and suddenly you realize that this pretty flower just bends over in the middle, you know? Tuk-a-chunk. And you go and you push it back up again. And when you take your fingers off, it goes ka-chunk. And you think, oh, no, I can't make it stay up. It's just going to keep falling over. It's bruised. It's bruised. And if you keep doing that for too long, it's going to break, right? But here he's saying a bruised stick, a bruised reed, a bruised stem. He's not going to break that. Maybe you are a bruised stem. And you know you're broken somewhere back there. Right? You know something's injured you and it's hurt you. He's not going to break you. And you know, you've got a bit of something burning and there's a last little tiny bit with a little orange glow and a little bit of smoke coming up. You could go, and you could put it out with your finger. But even that, he will not put it out. Right? The smoking ember. He's not going to put it out. And I realized I can trust God. If there's anyone I can trust, it's God. I can safely trust him. I'm safest when I'm falling into his arms. Now, God led me over a number of years, in my later teenage years, early 20s, into a whole bunch of areas of freedom. And I remember having a conversation one day with my older brother. And he and I had both come into an experience of being close to God at about the same time. And I knew that God was working in our family. And I said to my brother Lawrence, I said, you know when God gets in your life and he starts talking to you about things? And my brother said, no. I said, yeah, you know, you, you sort of, you, you, you worship God, you hear God's word, you go to church and God speaks to your heart and he shows you. My brother said, I haven't got a clue what you are talking about. I thought, I'm sure this was happening for everybody. I just thought this was normal, that when you get close to God, he begins to move in on you. And I didn't really want him to. I was pushing him away. And here's my brother saying that he didn't know what I was talking about. And I realized that God, by his grace, had allowed me to go on a journey that led me into freedom that not everybody was going on that same journey. And I remember being in New Zealand at a Bible college uh, outreach, I was going in a car with some other young people heading off to preach for the weekend and we were sharing our stories and I began to share the story about how I used to go red like a beetroot and tears streaming down my face and how that God set me free and I had a real wonderful breakthrough, blah, blah, blah. And there were two girls in, in the car with us um, and uh, Jean, it was, I think in the back seat, said, how did God do that? Like, really confronting. How did God do that? And I said, I, I, I don't know. He, God did it. You know, he did it by his spirit. You know, he just moved in your life, does that sort of stuff. You know, he just did that over a period of time. And she said, you've got no right to tell anybody that story unless you can tell them how God did it for you. Because maybe we have the same needs and you've raised hope in us and we want to be able to have the same freedom and you can't give it to us, and you've only made us feel worse. I went away and I said to God, God, what did you do? I mean, it just happened. Like it happened It happened one Sunday after another, and over time it just happened, and, and I fought with you, and I wrestled with you, and you kept showing me things, and I, it took a couple of years of just going through that process. I, I didn't write a catalog and a diary. I just lived, and it just happened. So I said, God, show me what you did. And God began to remind me of a number of things that he had to take me through before I could get to freedom. And I realized they were the steps that God took me through to bring me into release or into freedom. And so I wrote them down. I called them the steps to release. And I'm going to walk you through those steps today, give you a copy so you can take away to pray over and use and share with others. It's not copyright material. The Bible says... Freely you have received, freely give. So I'm happy to give you freely what God has done in my life. I didn't even know he was doing it until after the work was done. And I've used those same steps over and over again on myself. 
I've used them to help Susan. I've used them to help my children. I've used them to help friends and people in my ministry around the world. I've used those steps over and over and over again. And I found that they are pretty well universal. It's not one size fits all, but the steps themselves tend to lead people through filtering out their own stuff so that they can be able to get the help that they need. So I'm going to walk you through those. And I particularly want you to journey with the steps yourself because then you'll have a much better grip on them and you'll be much better able to help other people with them. So here's what I want you to do. I need you to select an unresolved issue in your life. Now, it could be a weakness, it could be a hurt, it could be a fear, it could be an attitude, it could be a habit. I don't really quite care what it is. It's something in your life that you know you wished you could have been free of, but you're not. Maybe you're impatient. Maybe there are some people and you just can't forgive. You're never going to let them off the hook for what they did. I don't know what it is. It could be anything. If there is an unresolved issue in your life, that comes to your mind, then say, okay, I'll choose that one. Okay, that's the one I'm going to work with. And as we go through the steps, I want you to apply each of those steps to that particular issue so that you can unpack it and see God's blessing come upon that issue. Now, maybe you've been hurt, attacked, abused in some way by people. Maybe you've been lied to. Maybe you've been disappointed. Maybe you've made some uh, monumental blunders. Uh, Maybe there's things, and just pick one thing so that you can use that for no other reason than to be able to map your way through these steps following that one particular issue. And I want you to understand that this is a spiritual battle. Often in life, we find ourselves fighting with and arguing with people, and we assume that it's because they're difficult or it's because this or whatever. But Look at what Paul said in Ephesians 6. He says, We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That means there are certain kinds of demons, certain kinds of of fallen angels that serve Satan who actually work in different places. Notice it's almost like a, a corporation. You've got your your wickedness in high places, you've got the rulers of the darkness of this world, you've got principalities, and then you've got powers. It's like a pecking order of people in a company in different positions, taking orders from the one above, and they are being assigned to be able to destroy you. Why? Because the devil hates God, and therefore God's creation, the people that should spend eternity with him, the devil wants to destroy them and take them to hell. And when you put your faith in Jesus and Jesus comes to set you free, the devil starts fighting, no, you can't have them. You can't have them. Well, they can go to heaven, but they're going to stay angry. And so there's a wrestle going on over you and over what's happening in your life. It is a spiritual battle. I want you to know that Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus took on human flesh and blood so that, as Hebrews says, so that through death he could destroy him that had the power of death. That's the devil. And that's why Jesus was able to say to his disciples in John 16, he says, in the world you will have trials, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So life may not always be easy, but you are on the winning side. These are the steps I'm going to take you through today. To admit your need, to identify the real issue that has to be dealt with, to repent of your wrongs if there's any, to forgive all offenders if there are any, to break with the evil, to resist the evil, and to give your mess to God. It's that simple, and yet that's a profound journey. And I want you to walk the journey rather than just try and file that away in your head. So I'm going to take you first to step number one, to admit your need. It takes humility to admit our needs, Because the pride of life is one of the evils of this age, 1 John 2 tells us. We know that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And when we hide our problems and our sin, things get worse. 